You're listening to Now I've Heard Everything, interviews from the 80s, 90s, and 2000s with voices from the past. This is the first time that they have a woman king in the town, and for me to sit down with all those elders, you know, and they said, uh, you are a woman, shut up for us to rule you. Pegaline Bartels, also known as King Peggy, today on Now I've Heard Everything. I'm Bill Thompson. When you were a kid, did you ever have that fantasy that you were actually, secretly, a prince or a princess or a king or a queen, but nobody knew it? Well, for one woman living in suburban Washington, D.C., that fantasy, that dream, became a reality. It was back in 2008 when Peggy Lean Bartels, a woman who was working as a secretary at the Embassy of Ghana in Washington, got a phone call in the night. Her uncle, back in Ghana, had passed away. And as a result, she had been chosen the new king of the town of Otwam in her native Ghana. Well, suddenly, faced with a dizzying array of new responsibilities, King Peggy went to Ghana, took over the town of Otwam, and soon discovered it wasn't all gold and silver and jewels and palaces and things. In 2012, she wrote a book about her experience called, appropriately enough, King Peggy. And that's when I had the chance to meet her. So here now, from 2012... King Peggy. Your story resonates with perhaps a Western audience more than others because there's a long kind of fantasy that we that goes back to some of the books we read in childhood that someday it would turn out that we were actually a prince or a princess yes. or a king or a queen. Yes. Everybody kind of fantasizes about that. And to you, it happened. It came true. It came true. And then it's amazing that even the, the, the very unique part is that a woman to be a king. Because usually when you say a king, they think of a male. Mm -hmm. And for a woman to be a king, that had really helped the Western world to embrace the whole thing. And also to see me in person, because most of the time, the kings and the queens, you know, you don't, you know, see them, you only see them on television. Or on the back of money. Yes. (laughs) And, And here is a woman, you know, an ordinary secretary who has been, you know, chosen as a king. And that's, you know, really helped the world to know that anything can happen to anybody and then you have to be ready to accept the calling. This is not just a ceremonial figurehead position. You you are, you have authority. Yes, I do. I do have an authority because um, being a traditional ruler, you are in charge of your town. And I have 7,000 people in my town. And uh, I can, you know, uh, be with them whenever there's a dispute. I have to be there to, you know, uh, supervise and delegate people to go through the dispute. The only time that I can't, you know, you know have a, such anything to do with a dispute is when it's a murder case. That one, it's really big. And they have to take it to high court or whatever it is. But most of the time, like, uh, you know, wife beating, argument with sisters, you know, someone beating somebody, someone stealing somebody's money, I'm there to, you know, really, you know, uh, deal with it in my uh, throne, in my palace. But you are not a politician. No, I'm not a politician. Traditional rulers are different from politicians because we are really, you know, neutral from the politics. We only have our own palace and our town to deal with. So we don't really mingle with politics at all. Well, of course, you're a authority comes from a higher power. Yes, because, you know, but uh, there are two different things because uh, there is difference between a government and then also a traditional ruler because government deals with all the major issues of the country. Whilst a traditional ruler, you deal with your little town that you have and your people. So it's different, you know, uh, entities all together. I've, I've heard you tell the story now several times about how you got the Make a phone call in the middle of the night. You thought it was a prank. Uh, you thought somebody was trying to pull a joke on you. You almost hung up. It does it even after all the times that you've told the story. Does it still not quite seem quite real? Well, you know, sometimes, you know, I said to myself, is it real? Is it happening to me? And then, you know, really lately I realized it's happening because um, I realized I've been able to change lives of 7,000 people by, you know, helping them with water and then, you know, education, you know, and bringing about changes into their lives. And also going around the country, you know, promoting my book where people have really embraced my story, really, you know, made me to think that this is real. I'm really on a journey for a king, and then, you know, it has really gotten into me right now. Now, let me come back to that fantasy a lot of people have about suddenly becoming a king, a queen, a prince. It's all riches and gold and luxury and servants and no problems. 
there were problems in Otwam. You went over there and there were things were not luxurious. No, um, to be honest with you, in Africa, especially with the small towns and the villages, uh, when you are chosen as a king or a queen or a chief, it's not like in Europe where you have everything on a silver platter. You have to bring changes to them. You have to better their lives to be able to reap the repo- uh, to be able to reap the fruit of your labor. Because when I went to Otwam, you know, um, I had to pay for my own coronation. Whilst in Europe, you don't have to pay for your own coronation. And also, I realized that the town doesn't have any running water. I have to help them by have, giving them good, you know, water because the children don't have to wake up five o'clock in the morning that like they were doing before. And then now they have a good running water. And also, I've been able to help them whereby, you know, some of the children of school age that were not going, were roaming about in the beaches are now in school. So um, it's not easy to be, you know, an African king or a queen or a chief. But, you know, God's so good, you know, I'm really doing it being a woman. There was, I mean, you've come to accept the idea that there is a reason that you were chosen. Yes, there is a reason because um, when I was called at four o'clock in the morning that had changed my life, I was a little bit reluctant to accept it because uh, I knew that it comes with uh, uh, financial responsibilities and it's not easy. And here is a secretary who lives a very modest life, you know, so drive my uh, 1992 Honda Accord that I haven't been able to purchase a new one, you know, and going to be a king, you know, in Africa, especially in a little town where we don't have any money and then the town is only a fishing town. So it means it comes with a lot of responsibilities. But uh, then I started hearing the voices which told me, Nana, go for it. It's your destiny. It's not every day that a woman is born to be a king. And it went on for, you know, three days. And that's when I accepted it. And to be honest with you, people are really helping me and I'm doing well by them. And it makes me really proud. It must have been a little disturbing to you, though, to find out after a certain period of time that, not all the tax money was going where it was supposed to be going, and things weren't quite the way they were supposed to be in Otuam. I mean, it must have been kind of disturbing and disappointing to you. Well, it was. It was. Because, you know, like, as I said, when I went to the town, being a chosen king, you thought that you were going to be in a, a very nice car, you know, a good palace and all that. And when I got there, you know, I realized that the town was really in a complete mess, where my palace was in ruins, my uncle was in a mug, and also um, my Elders have been, you know, embezzling the uh, fishing fees from the town and also the land fees. So all these things were really disturbing. But since, you know, I really chose to accept the calling, I was really strong about it. And I, you know, I I was determined. And I said, since I have accepted it, I have to really find a solution to the problem. And that was exactly what I did. And I'm really doing well by them. And I'm happy that uh, it has also transformed me to be able to connect with my family members and the people of the town. Whilst before it was just an ordinary secretary coming home, having my wine and watch TV and listen to telephones and go to bed. But this time those energies are being channeled to help my people. So the least chance that I have, I have to really talk to them. I'm with them 24 seven every day, you know, to know what's going on. And also they also call me and tell me what's going on and all the help that I can get for them. That's all my energies are really channel to to help them because it's a really huge calling and I don't want to fail them. So I'm really working hard towards my goal and to help them to the best that I know how. When I was reading in your book how you put out the call for new elders and a woman, a loud woman showed up. <laughs> I'm, as I'm reading your book, I said to myself, and no disrespect, I said, you go girl. I said, <laughs> This is what the town needs. Yes, yes, you know, because um, when I went first and we had our first meeting, and here is a town that most of my elders are set in their own ways. They are 50s, 60s, 70s that they haven't been ruled by a woman because this is the first time that they have a woman king in the town and besides in my family. And for me to sit down with all those elders, you know, and they said, uh, you are a woman, shut up for us to rule you, you know, and then I have to tell them, yes, I'm a woman, but I have a strength of a male and I'm a chosen. King, so you have to sit down for me to rule you, not for you to rule me. So um, it wasn't easy. It was a battle. It was really a battle. Yes. 
But now when I see pictures of Otom, you have running water. You have the, the so the kids don't have to walk half an hour each way to get a single bucket. Yeah. You have clean water for people. The, and your palace looks magnificent. Thank you know, you. the nice blue paint job and everything. Just, you've done a marvelous job so far. Yes, I have, you know, with the help from um, Shallow Baptist Church of Landover, Maryland, and their pastor, B. Lewis Collerton. They gave me a covenant, which I have it, you know, by the door, that uh, they were going to help me. And at first I thought, you know, they were kidding, but uh, I I realized they were serious. So they've been going with me every year to Ghana, and they have been able to help me with one clean borehole water. And then my co-author, Elena Diamond, also gave me $7,000 for one clean borehole water and also had adopted two children that he's dedicating them to. She's dedicating them to university level. And then uh, also a Freemason's Lodge in Maryland, you know, has also, you know, given me one borehole water. So in other words, I'm really doing a lot for them with the children and not have to wake up five o'clock in the morning to go to, sc- to work or to, you know, get uh, water before going to school and being tired and go there to sleep. Now they are doing well. So I think within my few uh, years of reigning, which is about four years, I've been able to, you know, done a lot for them as compared to my uncles that they came earlier before me being males. Sometimes you just got to shake things up a bit. Yes, you have to. You have to. And then, uh, you know, when I shook them up, you know, they were really, you know, reluctant to accept me from the beginning. They thought uh, I was from another planet. Then they realized that I'm not from another planet, but I'm for real. You know, after I really had a battle with them. So now, you know, they are very receptive of me and things are going well. And I hope to give them more because we need to have a toilet in the town. They don't have any. And I'm really working hard and also trying to help them with an ambulance because uh, we have a clinic that, you know, we are really trying to renovate and bring an ambulance for the people to use instead of them, you know, struggling, you know, when somebody is really having a heart attack or something that they have to take a taxi to the bigger cities and sometimes they die along the way. So these are all the things that, you know, my energy is really channeled to to be able to help them. It's some it, things like the town of Silver Spring takes for granted. I mean, of course we have ambulances. Of course there's running water and, and clean toilets and, things, and yes. fine educations and great buildings mm-hmm. and building inspectors and mm-hmm. rat uh, crews and things that, to take care of, you know, the exterminators and things. All those things that we take for granted, you have to really work for. Yes. You know, sometimes I, when I go to speak to people, I said, we, you know, America is really blessed. People are blessed. And we really take things for granted. And that we should try and give thanks to God. Anytime that we go to the bathroom, we flush a toilet, we have to give thanks to God. When our children or the young ones wake up to go to school, we have to give thanks to God. When we are sick, we call 911 and then the ambulance comes and take you to hospital, we have to give thanks to God. So we shouldn't take things for granted. But, you know, in other world, you know, they don't take things for granted. The little thing that they will have, it meant a lot to them. And they really, really, you know, look after it very well. So um, I think uh, there are so many things. That's the main reason why also I really, you know, brought the book about for the world to know that they may, there are other areas in the world, in the Western world, where they are blessed. And they also have to really, you know, bless other countries that they are not blessed like them. Yes. Were there certain little rules that you had to, to learn to? I mean, because a king can't do just anything they want. Yes, you know, being a king, there are certain etiquette that we have to follow. You can't argue in the public. You can't eat in the public. You can't go clubbing. You know, where you have to dance and wave your hand in the air and misbehaving. You know, you have to do everything in a very dignified way. Even if you are walking, somebody you know really insults you. You just have to smile and then, you know, just pass us on. And uh, it's a little bit hard, but I'm learning. And before, I wouldn't have, you know, really, you know, know that I can do all that. But since I became the king and I have to respect my stool and my elders and then the town, I'm really, you know, doing well with all this etiquette. I'm so happy. You have 7,000 children. Yes, I have 7,000 children because I'm a childless woman. But now God had blessed me with 7,000 children. And I want to be a very good role model for the children and the town, especially the women, to know that, you know, a woman can do it, and then that's what I'm exactly doing. Pegaline Bartels, also known as King Peggy, still lives in suburban Washington, D.C. She still works at the Embassy of Ghana, and she's still king. Now, you can get a copy of King Peggy by Pegaline Bartels by tapping on the link in our show notes or by going to our website, heardeverything.com. We may earn an Amazon commission if we make a purchase. HeardEverything.com is where you'll also find my 2006 interview 
with Nobel Peace Prize winner Wangari Matai. We saw how people in power refused to be the custodians of the resources as they were expected and instead used their position to enrich themselves with the resources. And my 1993 interview with the first elected female principal chief of the Cherokee Nation, Wilma Mankiller. I think even my name conjures up visions of someone who probably rides to work on a horse. There are a lot of stereotypes about uh, Native people. And as you know, we post new episodes of Now I've Heard Everything every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and you can find us everywhere you listen to podcasts. Thank you so much for listening. Next time on Now I've Heard Everything, as we get ready for Halloween, we'll revisit my 1991 interview with the man who wrote the book on why we scare ourselves, Walter Kendrick. Prior to the mid-18th century, they would wait until the soil had supposedly dissolved your flesh, and then your skeleton would be extracted and put up in a place called a charnel house for decoration. And people would stroll through charnel houses on Sunday afternoons. That's next time on Now I've Heard Everything. I'm Bill Thompson. Thompson.